to start off today's episode by talking about a case that both Liz and I covered before Alec Murdoch decided to kill Maggie and Paul in 2021. It is about a man named Ekron Frazier, who unfortunately, but predictably, came up on our radar again recently. In many ways, Ekron's case has contributed to our drive to fight for victims by bringing sunlight to areas of the justice system that have existed in the dark corner for far too long. I know that the 14th Circuit Solicitor's Office would rather we not bring those things up or question any of their prosecutorial decisions. Duffy, like the Murdochs when they were in office, has grown used to running unopposed and his track record shows it. Case in point, Ekron Odell Frazier, who will turn 60 in February. Frazier has an alarming history of violence against women, and yet the 14th Circuit Solicitor's Office let him off easy three times now. To start off, I want to say I believe that people can be rehabilitated. I believe that they can change and be better that they can learn from their prison time and devote the rest of their lives to being upstanding citizens. But I also believe that when someone shows you who they are, you need to believe them, especially when who they are is a danger to society. So almost 20 years after Ekron Frazier was convicted of killing Bertha Neiman, he was charged in her rape. And thus began an interesting conversation. Frazier was nearing the end of his sentence for killing Bertha and for robbing the Hampton Inn. He had never pleaded guilty to sexually assaulting her or had taken any accountability for it whatsoever. Worse than that, while in prison, Frazier was disciplined multiple times for sexual infractions, meaning, on paper at least, it did not look like Frazier had been rehabilitated. This presented a problem for Bob and for the sheriff's office. Helton Head is not just a beautiful place to live, it's largely made up of retirees. In other words, the age group that seemed to appeal to Frazier. Frazier's case was unusual because no one had ever heard of a man being convicted of one crime committed against a woman, and then 20 years later being charged for a second crime committed against that woman at the same time that the first crime had been committed. It was so encouraging to see law enforcement value a woman's life in that way to say that it also mattered to them that she was raped before she died, to want to hold the person who did this to her accountable for it. That's a very, very close-knit family, great people, uh, very cooperative in the investigation, very appreciative. And, and again, they would expect us to do diligence. Uh, they were all about uh, prosecuting him uh, for the sexual assault of their mother, and, uh, and so was I, and so was the sheriff's office in general. So. You know, it, it would never occur to me to, unless it was double jeopardy, we could not prosecute the case to allow this to occur and give him a break on it. It just it didn't make any sense to me at all. And now, fast forward, 2023 in November, he's on the sexual offender registry. He fails to show up to register. So where is Ekman Frazier now? Where is this repeat offender? Where is this repeat offender that clearly was a danger to the community? Danger community ought to be a, a, you know, on the sexual offender registry and required to register. I was hoping for it to be prosecuted. And certainly when you bring a charge, that's what you expect. Um, and it, it was a solid charge. We're talking about, and I, I don't have the DNA report in front of me, but the statistics, statistics were, you know, I mean, just overwhelming. Like one, you know, one in seven quadrillion or something like that. And I believe that's like fifteen zeros on top of seven, actually. But yes, it, it, there was it was huge numbers, a good case. Unfortunately, this isn't what happened. We asked Bob to elaborate on why the Fourteenth Circuit Solicitor's Office, aka Duffy's Office, decided to drop the case in August of 2021, effectively signing Frazier's get out of jail free card. I, I'd rather not get into that directly. I, I wasn't satisfied with it clearly, um, yeah, clearly, and uh, still am not. And you know, when I was going through Instagram, uh, you know, over the past several days, up pops Ekron Frazier, up he pops, and I believe I, I know what I did with that. I looked at it and I was like, my God, here we go again, here we go again, and it's uh, it's alarming, 
And this should, you know, it should not have slipped through the cracks, clearly. I mean, it should not have. It was a, a good case, in my estimation. I've been working criminal investigations for over 30 years. So I, I could look at something and say, yeah, okay, this is worth prosecuting. Like, again, going back to 2001, where we're looking at the totality of what we had. If we went to trial for, uh, for murder or sexual assault, either or, uh, we stood, stood a good chance of losing that case in front of a jury. So this particular case with the DNA evidence to support it, again, I believe there's two areas of DNA. Uh, that matched Ekram Frazier, and uh, that's that's solid. There were several things that stood out that it's just like, wait, well, this is not somebody that's done anything to rehabilitate. Somebody is back out, and it's like suspended animation when they're in prison. We go back to the Teddy Powell case, and you and I have talked about that. He was gone for 20-some odd years when he gets right back out. Now he's savvy about how to destroy evidence, and he's going to do the same thing in Georgia. You know, I mean, that could be a topic for another conversation, but that was... The biggest learning case in my career. I learned more from that, just looking at prior bad acts, what these people do and how they progress from peeping toms to, you know, sexual assaults and murder. And this. Wow. We don't have to tell you how often rape cases go unprosecuted or how often victims are further harmed by a system purporting to want to help them. That's why this case frustrated us so much. Here was a case that offered prosecutors an opportunity to show the 14th Circuit what they're made of and what they value. This was an unusual case and could have stood as an example of what comes from never giving up. Yes, at the end of the day, Bob was able to get an answer for the victims who never left his mind. But now he had to witness the family's disappointment and fear as the man who had killed their mother was about to be released. Which brings us back to the original point. T. Murdoch doesn't have evidence of jury tampering. Or enough evidence. Certainly nothing that is a slam dunk. And they know that. A strong case doesn't need an uneven playing field. But that is what Dick and Jim are striving to get. So Dick and Jim are asking the court to allow them to present the same testimony over and over. They are asking the court to force Becky to take the stand publicly so her likely nervous demeanor will be on full display and so everyone can see her plead the fifth and look guilty of all the things that she's accused of, including jury tampering. They are asking the court to deny the state's motion to strike the affidavits from Dick's secretary, statements about the jury deliberation, and any claims regarding Facebook posts, Miss Hill's book deal, or post-trial interactions. And they are asking the court to use the preponderance of evidence standard, an easier standard, to make its decision. Additionally, they are arguing that only one juror is needed to make their case. They have warned the court that, quote, it is likely several jurors will testify that they have never heard any such jury tampering and that they do not believe it occurred. They say it is not a direct contradiction of the testimony of jurors who say they saw and heard it. To be clear, there are not jurors who heard it. There's Egg Lady, who did not render a verdict. There is the alternate juror who also did not render a verdict and who Becky criticized in her book. And there's Juror 630, whose accusation of Becky is almost word for word what Creighton and Judge Newman said during the trial. But Dick and Jim are asking the court not to consider the word of other jurors. They are arguing that only Becky, the person whose word means nothing right now, can contradict the egg lady, juror 630, and the alternate. Okay, again, we think their brief is an admission that they don't have it. They don't have what they need to prove there was jury tampering. They claim that Ellick has not been able to conduct any discovery in this case whatsoever, which we know not to be true. Quote, all he has are voluntary statements made by jurors and other witnesses willing to talk to his lawyers and information published by journalists. See, they admit what they have here is everything we've already seen. They say that this is all they have until they are authorized to issue their own subpoenas for the January 29th hearing. 
The biggest question heading into this hearing on Tuesday was how Judge Toll would interpret the law. If she would decide on Alec Murdoch's new trial based on evidence of Becky's actions with the jurors affecting the verdict, or based on evidence showing that Becky's communication with the jurors could have affected the verdict. It didn't take Judge Toll long at all to make a clear decision on that and set the tone for the entire hearing. A presumption is not the way to uh, examine this issue, but rather specific evidence about what was said, when it was said, and how it was perceived by the juror is what I believe is required uh, by State versus Green and other cases. We will get into this more, but wow, Justice Toll was incredibly decisive, confident, and clear throughout Tuesday's three-hour hearing. There was no guessing whatsoever in what she was thinking. As it involves questions to Ms. Hill, similarly, uh, this is not a time to explore every mistake or uh, incorrect statement or false statement that ever has been made by this witness. I am the judge of the credibility of this witness for purposes of this new trial motion. I don't think it's necessary, nor do I think it's proper, to explore each and every uh, uh, impropriety uh, alleged to have been committed by the clerk. And she was not having whatever made-up mush Dick Harpootlian was serving. If they were friends, as several people suspected and there was historical evidence of, then Justice Toll swept that relationship out the door and focused on the facts of the case. If that makes sense. Uh, it doesn't make complete sense to me uh, because this is not the trial of Ms. Hill. Uh, and uh, issues about uh, motive and so forth and the possible commission of crimes uh, are not what this inquiry is about. It is about her contact with any of the jurors and what she said. I swear, I watched Dick shrink several inches as Justice Toll schooled him on the law. You're speaking to me about something uh, in a complete vacuum as far as I'm concerned, so I can't really uh, evaluate that. Oh, and she was crystal clear that she was in command. I'm perfectly capable of, of evaluating what the jurors tell me. Uh, and um, I'll do that. I think I'm also perfectly capable of evaluating the credibility of uh, Ms. Hill uh, and the jurors. From the get-go, Justice Toll set the agenda. She told the state and defense that they were here to discuss four matters. First was whether an evidentiary hearing was necessary. Even though she had already decided there would be a hearing, she wanted the arguments preserved for the record. The second was determining who had the burden of proof, what must be shown to meet that burden of proof, and what must be shown to contest that burden of proof. Third was hearing from both sides about the procedural timing issue in which the state believes that Dick and Jim knew about the allegations from the egg lady juror immediately after the trial, and therefore they're arguing that all of this is moot because Team Murdoch was required to bring these allegations to the court's attention within 10 days if they wanted to use it as a reason for a new trial. And then fourth and finally, and what Justice Toll called the heart and soul of her agenda, they were to discuss the guidelines for who would be a witness what evidence would be allowed, and who would do the questioning. So for both Mandy and me, this was our first time seeing Justice Toll in action, and we were both struck by how thorough she was and how clear. When someone is that thorough and that clear, you immediately know that person is aware of their own thoroughness and their own clarity, and by golly, you had better be listening with both ears. Meaning, if she were your professor, you'd be sitting up straight and taking notes. Big Creighton Energy came on strong, the way Big Creighton Energy does. Speaking for nearly 10 minutes, Creighton told the court that he agreed with the judge's interpretation of the rule. After we published last week's episode, the defense submitted a revised pre-hearing brief adding Creighton Waters and his paralegal, Carly Jewell, to the witness list. The defense contends that Becky favored the state during the trial, and as evidence, they are using forwarded emails from Becky to the prosecution. The emails are from people who were watching the trial asking her to forward these emails to Creighton. 
According to Creighton on Tuesday, the state and the defense traded all correspondence they received from Becky during the trial, and lo and behold, the defense was also receiving information from Becky, meaning she wasn't just favoring the state, as they claim. Additionally, Creighton put this on the record. The only juror that we have is the one who filed the affidavit, that's 630, and even she, or that person only said uh, that uh, she, uh, you know, eventually voted guilty because she felt pressured by the other jurors, did not even mention uh, any external impact. And so unless she's going to change her story, that is what was in her affidavit. She is going to change her story. That's a very important point moving forward, by the way. Now that the defense has been hobbled and told to stick to the facts, what do they have? The jurors are locked in by their statements. If they change their stories on January 29th, there goes their credibility. Not to mention, each one of those jurors was polled by Judge Newman. They already attested to their verdict being impartially theirs. The jurors have little wiggle room for changing what they have already said. She said what she said. We're narrowing the scope and we're not going to handle the case the way Team Murdoch wants it to be handled. So our legal sources have pointed out that a lot of what Dick was doing in his arguments was preparing for a future appeal of Justice Toll's decision if she ends up denying them a new trial. In limiting the scope of the evidentiary hearing, she's limiting what they can bring up, not just in terms of who gets questioned and who does the questioning, but in terms of the timeline. She's limiting them to the six weeks of trial. Anything Becky did outside of that time frame is not considered material unless it relates directly to allegations of the jury tampering, meaning the ethics complaints, the books, all of it is not going to be allowed. In response to that, Dick wanted to offer a proffer, a written record of the allegations against Becky that they want to raise and that the judge won't allow. Here's how Justice Toll responded to that. But I will put certain uh, limitations on just a wholesale exploration of every uh, problematic piece of conduct, uh, ethical, uh, dealings with the county, uh, and so forth. Uh, this is a very focused inquiry about this jury and its ability to render the verdict it rendered in an impartial manner. So I say that to tell you that when the clerk is offered, and I think the clerk is going to have to be offered as a witness, the whole allegation revolves around uh, the contention that the clerk made contact with the jury about matters material to their verdict, that that contact was improper, and, and that it impacted their verdict. Uh, there's a whole lot more that Mr. Harkootling has indicated he'd like to explore that I regard as totally extraneous to the inquiry that we maintain. I'm not going to allow those questions uh, to be asked by way of proffer and then have the clerk answer those questions and have that be the proffer, although I consider them irrelevant questions. We're not going to uh, handle the case in that way. Totally extraneous to the inquiry. Irrelevant questions. These are not phrases that are music to Team Murdoch's ears. One last thing about Tuesday's status conference that's important. Even though Justice Toll effectively ruined Dick and Jim's dastardly plans to trick the system into allowing Illich to have a new trial, she did so artfully and according to the law. She was clear about her reasoning, she offered support for her opinions, and she was circumspect. She not only ruled on the matters in front of her, but on matters that may come out of any future appeal, meaning she didn't shut them down completely on everything. She quite consciously left open the possibility that she might change her mind if the defense is able to provide more evidence than they have thus far. After Tuesday, I felt hopeful more so than ever that T. Murdoch's reign of judicial terror will end soon and that Justice Toll just might be the woman to finish the job. Stay tuned, stay pesky, and stay in the sunlight.